going to present. Okay. Welcome to today's webinar presented by the Australian Research Data Commons or ARDC in collaboration with the Council of Australian University Librarians or CAL and the Australasian Open Access Strategy Group, which is known as AOASG. The topic of today's webinar is Fair Beyond Data. And uh, my name is Natasha Simons. I'm the Associate Director for Data and Services at the ARDC, and I'll be your host for today. Before we begin the presentations, please note that you are all in listen-only mode, which means that if you, you're all muted and if you'd like to make a question or make a comment, you can use the question pod. Um, we will have a number of speakers and we'll get to your questions and discussion towards the end in due course. I'd like to begin with an acknowledgement of country. And as I'm located at the University of Queensland, I acknowledge the Turbal and Yagara people as traditional owners and their custodianship of the lands on which we meet today, which is in the Brisbane area for me. And on behalf of ARDC, I pay our respects to their ancestors and their descendants who continue cultural and spiritual connections to country. We recognise their valuable contributions to Australian and global society. So the Australian Research Data Commons was formed on 1st of July 2018 and as a new initiative our history is short. However we bring to the e-research sector over 10 years of experience on research data infrastructure and services by building on legacy initiatives including the Australian National Data Service, the National e-research Collaboration Tools and Resources or NECTAR project and the Research Data Services or RDS. We are funded by the Australian Government through the National Collaborative Research Infrastructure Strategy Program or NCRIS and we help develop infrastructure that enables Australian researchers to gain competitive advantage through data. So the ARDC is a strong advocate for the FAIR data principles which are a set of global guiding principles to make data findable, accessible, interoperable and reusable. We build support for FAIR into our programs and partnerships and the initiatives that we take. And we're also in the final week of delivering an eight week FAIR Data 101 course, which we offer to the sector as a way of providing people with skills in enabling FAIR data. So while the ARDC's primary focus is on enabling FAIR data, we recognise that data is best discovered and reused in context, in the context of other research materials, particularly publications. And in this webinar, we are collaborating with Call and AOASG, who will take us on a world, who will take us to a world of fair beyond data, and um, show us that fair can be applied not just to data alone. And with that, I'd like to hand over to Professor Ginny Barber, who's the executive director of the AOASG. When I work out how to do that. Okay, Ginny. Excellent. Thank you very much, Natasha, and thank you very much to the ARDC. I hope that you're able to see my screen. X. It looks like that's all good. Um, so thank you very much. We're very delighted to be part of this webinar. Uh, my name is Ginny Barber. As Natasha said, I'm the director of the Australasian Open Access Strategy Group. Um, I'll just briefly introduce my co-speakers. So Angus Cook is the content procurement manager at CALL, the Council of University Librarian, Australian University Librarians, and Martin Borshut, who is the chair of the AOSG and also the university librarian at the University of New South Wales. Um, uh, Martin, um, Angus will be talking about uh, FAIR, what publishers are doing to make work FAIR, and Martin will be talking about FAIR uh, in repositories. And I'm just going to give a brief overview to set the scene. So these are the things I'm going to cover. I'm going to talk a bit about where the FAIR principles began and how they became to be uh, thought of uh, being applicable beyond data. I'm going to talk about concepts of free, open and fair, which are kind of quite confusing often and um, how they relate to each other. I'll talk a little bit about whole of system approaches. And then I just want to end by touching on the idea of fair in the context of open research more generally and some, uh, some bigger principles. 
So um, you'll probably all be very familiar with the idea that FAIR has been around since 2016. There was a whole body of work that led to it, but this publication in 2016 described the four foundational uh, principles of findability, accessibility, interoperability, and reusable reusability. And although these principles were very much founded on data and described for data, um, it became pretty clear very early on that they could be applied to other research outputs. And in fact, the original publication itself talks about all scholarly digital research objects. So when you look at that, what does that mean more generally? <clears throat> there are actually some really rather specific um, items that are required to make uh, data in particular fully fair. Um, and this is a, um, a graphic that I did back in 2016 with Mark Hooper at, at QUT. Um, we did a, a, a few graphics that you'll see coming out. And these talked about, these just show um, the principles as they were li uh, laid out in that original publication. As you can see, they're pretty specific um, and they uh, have some really fairly um, uh, obvious technical requirements that are very important uh, in the context of data. But at the beginning, right at that time, quite a few people were already thinking, well, how might we apply that to research publications in particular? How might we boil down those publication, those principles to something that's, that's much simpler? And this is um, just a, a very short example of how um, research publications can be thought of as being fair. So just to take you through them all. So again, the findable is this concept of uh, having uh, the research output, the publication being associated with rich metadata, particularly persistent identifiers, the most important of which, which are ORCID identifier, ORCID for individuals and DOIs for research outputs, but, uh, but also now for um, uh, grants and for um, institutions, for example. Um, accessible, Jenny, this is the- Ginny, Ginny, yep. I'm sorry to interrupt you. Um, it is that your slides are cut off towards the right hand side. Oh, I'm, I'm sure sorry. It's causing that, but you can't see everything. You, you might want to go out of um, oh, okay. out of full presentation mode or something. Okay. Um, I think this is probably just the only one. It, maybe, can I just get, carry on with this and then I'll, um, if it's still a problem, sure. I'll, 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 I'll cut okay. back. Yeah. This is the, probably the longest slide. Okay, thanks for that. Um, okay, so accessible is this concept of being accessible via um, um, either a public uh, repository or an open publishing platform. Um, and that's in the context of publications. That's obviously journals, publishers, uh, or in institutional repositories in particular. We have this concept of interoperable, which is often not really considered particularly for research publications as important as for data. But in fact, it is increasingly important now, in particular in the context of um, uh, systematic reviews, when work is often harvested by uh, computers and is then incorporated into large systematic reviews and interoperability becomes very important at that point. And then reusable is this concept of uh, understanding what can actually be done with an article. And that in, uh, the most important concept here is the license that's associated with it. And most commonly, that's the Creative Commons license that, um, that many of you will be familiar with. Okay, so this idea of um, free and open, can I just check, how is that looking on the slide at the moment? It's sort of right to the, it yeah. is a little bit cut off still, just at the end. Okay, all right. Well, I'd, I'd rather do it like this, but let me, um, I'll, I'll, I'll just make sure I talk to the, the, the parts of it okay. as we go. All right. So, so back in 2017, this was shortly after the um, original articles were, were published on FAIR, um, a paper talking about FAIR in the context of the European Open Research, uh, Open Science Cloud, made this point that FAIR is not equal to open. Um, there'd been some confusion about that. And although the FAIR principles come from the open science movement in many ways, they deliberately don't address the, um, the idea of FAIR as in the concept of um, equity and the moral uh, parts, uh, issues that are often considered with open access more generally. So, um, it's there. I just wanted to then think a little bit about the concept of fair and open and how <clears throat> free and how they all relate together. So we're all very familiar with the concept of free. So free is something that can be downloaded from the internet that we can use for our, our own use, but we can't really do very much else with it. If you add a Creative Commons license onto it, then it becomes clear what the rights around sharing, uh, using and reusing are. And that's this is probably the concept that's most commonly uh, applied to um, open access. 
But FAIR takes that one step further, and this is the concept of the, uh, the rich metadata, the including the persistent identifiers that I mentioned, and the structured format. And then you end up with a fully machine-readable and discoverable uh, research output, which can be fully shared. And so I guess the ideal really for research publications in the long term is that items are both open and fair. So is there a sort of, uh, is one better than the other when you're thinking about publications? Um, on the one hand, for open access, we have a well-established community. There's been work going on in this area for more than 20 years. But as I've said, there are differing definitions, which can often lead to confusion around terminology. Whereas FAIR, although a relatively new approach, that has very clear definitions. And so what we have really, I think, is a way of thinking about that. It's the FAIR principles are the mechanism whereby an open access approach can be fully implemented. It provides rigor around openness um, that's quite important. So just thinking about that in the concept of a whole of system approach, um, back in 2016, at the same time as these principles came out on FAIR, um, a group uh, led by Linda O'Brien from Griffith University, but which is now led by Catherine Clark at Curtin, uh, which the AOSG is also part of, came up with a, a statement for FAIR for Australian publicly funded research. It incorporates the concept of FAIR, but also talks about the need for sustainable um, uh, dissemination models and actually critically the importance that researchers would be uh, rewarded to disseminate their work in this way. And work continues on this FAIR policy statement. There's a group around it that continues um, its work at the moment. And you'll see that FAIR is present in policies in Australia, so it's incorporated into, it was incorporated into the revised NHMRC open access policy, um, and, there's, and there's specific mention of it in the call statement on open scholarship in back in 2019. It's also present in global policies. So in 2016, the G20 leaders um, incorporated FAIR into their, uh, uh, their communique at the end of one of their uh, summits. Um, and much more recently, 2020, um, the Canadian Open Science Roadmap talked about the importance of FAIR as uh, research outputs being open by design, but design and by default, and that they should be FAIR. So it's becoming a term and a concept that is increasingly incorporated uh, both nationally and internationally into more than just the uh, specific principles. I just wanted to touch on why this has really become incredibly important at the moment. So uh, in the middle of this pandemic at the moment, a large amount of work has gone on in harvesting uh, the open, uh, uh, a number of, of all the research outputs that are coming out. And probably the most important of them is this CORD19 open research data set, which uh, is a large collaboration currently of more than 50,000 scholarly uh, articles. It includes a large collection of full text articles, but it also includes a very comprehensive metadata file. So that these articles really in the best form are completely fair. They may not be fully open, all of them, and it's certainly the case that some of the research articles have not been shared in the way that one might hope completely, but they are fully fair and they have rich metadata associated with them. And the licenses on them really shows how they can be used and reused. And I'm just going to finish by touching on the concept of FAIR in a couple of other ways. So first off, that we uh, there's a group known as the FAIR Open Access Alliance, which talks about FAIR in, in the terms of equity. Um, and they have a, a, a set of principles, which are obviously not the same as the FAIR principles we've discussed earlier, but they are the ones that talk about FAIR as in the concept of equity, access to all research and access to ability to publish. Um, and organisations that are part of that include the Open Library of Humanities and, a few, and some other specific publishers. And then I just wanted to add really at the end that the whole underpinning of open access more generally is this concept of fairness and equity. And in many ways, um, although the fair principles are something that's perhaps technologically uh, something that we might think of as being a, a technical solution, they are in the end very important for equity overall in that until you have uh, uh, articles that are fully fair, it's not really important possible for them to be part of uh, the open research ecosystem. So these slides will be available and I have some references on them, but I'll stop at that point and um, hand over to Martin um, and happy to take questions at the end. Uh, sorry, no, I'm handing over to Angus Cook, I apologise. Thanks, Jeannie. And my slide should be there on the screen. I think that's all looking okay. Okay. Um, well, 
thank you for joining us, everyone. Um, for the next 10 minutes, um, we will have a look um, at um, what publishers are doing, uh, to be fair. We're going to look um, particularly at OA business models uh, and, and journals uh, and put those um, OA business models under the FAIR microscope. Um, now, in 10 minutes, we can only really scratch the surface. Uh, and as many of you know, there's a huge range of issues and dependencies uh, when we start talking about OA business models. Uh, but we thought it might be good to make sure that we're all starting for the same point. So what we'll do is to just get an understanding um, of those business models uh, and what they mean. Um, I'm sure many of you will be familiar with some of these terms. That's read only, transformative agreement, read and publish, publish and read. Um, but these um, terms are quite often used interchangeably uh, and quite often used incorrectly. And they're also quite nuanced. And what one publisher calls read and publish might be called published and read by another one. So it's important to understand some of the differences. So we'll look at these models in a little bit more detail. Um, read only um, is the standard subscription to read only journal content. Um, it's the model used for the majority of our journal database and, and ebook access here in Australia. Uh, New Zealand for the subscriptions. This is what called procurement is, is perhaps most involved with um, at the moment. So it's a standard subscription model um, that we're all most familiar with. Read and publish um, is where the payment for reading and payment for publishing is bundled into the same contract. Uh, and really what's happening here is that we're redirecting the funds previously spent on the read component uh, into the publishing component. And then if we extend that idea a little bit further, we can say it's really part of a transformative agreement in many cases where that transition from read only to OA publishing happens in graduated steps uh, over a few or several years. Publish and read, uh, as opposed to read and publish, um, could be defined as publisher receives payment for publishing and the read component is included at no extra cost. Uh, and quite often, there's often a little mix up and a little bit of confusion between read and publish and publish and read. And yes, they do get used interchangeably. But just to be clear, uh, these OA agreements will allow for all publishing uh, from the institution under an OA agreement. Uh, and quite often, they will also include all access to all of the previously uh, published content prior to the agreement uh, as well. So looking at transformative agreements uh, in a little bit more detail in terms of what, how they actually work and, and what the mechanisms are and how they progress, let's just take this example here where we have um, an institution with a subscription uh, costing uh, $100,000 per year. Uh, and as we enter into the transformative agreement, we go into year one. And the read subscription fee will be 67 and the OA published fee will be 33,000. In year two, that starts to switch around a little bit. And the read subscription is 33,000 and the OA published fee is 67,000. And then by the time we reach year three, the OA published fee is 100,000. So we've completed that transformation uh, from a simple uh, annual read subscription fee to a purely OA fee and all of our publishing uh, is included with that as well. So that's what a transformative agreement looks like. Uh, there are some other models that you uh, will have heard of as well. Uh, flipped uh, is a term that's used to describe where a publisher uh, will deem it that they have sufficient income uh, from APC, so much so that they no longer need to charge libraries a subscription for that content. Uh, so at that point, they do what we call flip to open access. Uh, there are other models where publishers offer rebates and offsets, uh, such as Scope 3 you may have come across, and subscriptions are lowered for all institutions as a result of consortia OA funding. Uh, or in certain cases, the uh, publisher may just simply lower or offset the uh, price uh, from the OA publishing activity and, and reduce the price of the subscription. And there are some cases uh, where publishers uh, have, do, have done that. Uh, it's something that, that can be a little bit tricky in terms of measuring the outputs. Uh, and then lastly, we've got 
discounts on APC charges where publishers, uh, and this happens more with the, the pure OA publishers, they may offer a discount for pre-purchase or bulk purchases uh, of APCs. So I, I think now that we're all on the same page in regards to what these models look like, if we put them under the, the fair lens uh, and see if they're findable, accessible, uh, interoperable and reusable and whether they sort of adhere to the fair data principles um, that, that Ginny's introduced and mentioned. Um, if we start on the left here with findable, yes, we would expect transformative agreements, no agreements to be findable. Uh, outputs can be crawled by academic web search engines and metadata includes stable identifiers, identifiers such as DOIs and appropriate keywords, uh, ORCID IDs, that sort of thing. So, the major publishers have been uh, doing all these things for, for many, many years. Uh, their platforms and workflows accommodate uh, to ensure that metadata and uh, identifiers uh, are all there and present. Uh, when they're um, bringing in more open access content, uh, their platforms are already set up uh, to be findable. So usually there should not be uh, too much of an issue there. Uh, in terms of accessible, we get a big tick here uh, when we look at OA. Obviously, uh, anyone can access and download the research outputs for free from any location. OA content is in front of the paywall and copyright is retained by the author. So there is no password uh, required to access open access content. Uh, so, uh, one of the, I think the biggest elements in terms of FAIR is that the content is accessible. Interoperable. Outputs can be cited precisely and linked from other words. Works. Publishers should provide facilities to automatically deposit OA, article in, OA articles in institutional repositories. Now, Martin's going to talk a, a, a lot more about this, certainly a call requirement uh, when we're uh, entering into agreements with publishers in regards to OA, is that they should have this functionality to support uh, the automatic loading of articles into institutional repositories. Uh, so certainly that, that's one element of interoperability that we would expect. Uh, and then when we get to reusable, um, certainly uh, another tick there. Um, outputs are licensed in a way that allow for reuse and appropriate attribution. Uh, and that is because we request that the publishers allow Creative Commons licensing uh, for the authors so that the authors retain copyright. And so that content can be used um, elsewhere other than the, the publisher's own platform. It can be freely shared uh, and used in other ways. So. Certainly, yep, four ticks uh, when we look at FAIR in terms of the FAIR data principles. Um, but we do have some challenges uh, with um, agreements, particularly uh, in this region, which I'll just uh, elaborate on a little bit uh, in terms that um, we have high publishing outputs uh, in Australia and New Zealand. Uh, our research uh, output is uh, sometimes higher proportionally than other regions. So if you think back to the transformative agreement example that I showed a few slides ago, where we had a, an institution with a subscription for 100,000, uh, and we move into transformative agreement, the way that the publisher may look at this is to say, okay, well, this institution is publishing five open access uh, articles a year, typically into our hybrid or, or, or into gold journals, which is 15,000. And they also publish about 50 articles a year through normal channels, through non-OA publishing. And if we take the equivalent of that, which would be our typical APC charge of, of 3,000 uh, and times that by 50, and then add on what they're already doing with OA articles, that's $165,000 a year that the publisher is going to look like. So. Um, instead of this being a $100,000 cost to the institution, it's now $165,000. Uh, and again, uh, that's going to be a, a challenge in terms of finding that budget beyond the library. Uh, so again, on the fair, um, fair um, principles, yes, we would say that that's findable. Um, Yes, we would say it's interoperable, it should be reusable, but when we get to accessible, will we ever reach accessibility um, if we're having to work um, 
with these sorts of prices. So as I said, we have had some proposals uh, that are very similar to this, uh, but there is also, I think, um, acknowledgement from some publishers, particularly the society publishers, uh, that the pricing needs to be sustainable uh, and it needs to be affordable. And so they're making adjustments to bring that closer to the 100,000 than the 165,000, thankfully, uh, and we're able to work with those publishers further. So in terms of what Call is doing, uh, in regards to uh, procurement and OA. Um, there's a couple of documents that Ginny has mentioned already here. The call statement on open scholarship, March 2019, had seven action points, uh, the two of which are, uh, I suppose, most relevant to my world, uh, uh, number three, publishing, uh, to actively work with our research communities and support appropriate licensing and author rights management. And number five, content acquisition, to negotiate with publishers and vendors, a transparent commitment to open scholarship. Uh, and then in May, uh, just recently this year, um, Call released its roadmap to Plan S, 14 recommendations, <coughs> excuse me, number nine, OA publishing to pursue negotiations with open access publishers to minimize or eliminate transactional APCs. And number 12, to develop new consortium models for distributing costs within transformative agreements. So that gives us a framework to work with. Call has already signed some publish, sorry, some read and publish agreements. Uh, there was the Microbiology Society uh, agreement and the Portland Press agreements uh, late in 2019. Uh, this year has been challenging um, for obvious reasons. Our focus really has had to have been more on uh, negotiating the 2021 renewals. Uh, that said, we think that transformative agreements and read and publish agreements are really important and there are some conversations in place uh, uh, that we'll continue pursuing. Uh, and we're hoping to have some more announcements later this year. So in terms of keeping call agreements fair, we might look at that from a, a value perspective uh, rather than from a, a data perspective. Uh, and I suppose our elements in terms of, uh, and our principles in regards to, to value and, and fair uh, is transparency. Uh, agreements must be publicly available uh, and so Call will publish uh, finalised agreements on the ESAC website. Accountability is really important. Uh, what we know from our experience so far is that we need to validate any data given to us by publishers and vendors, not just at the beginning of the agreement, but as we go through the agreement as well, uh, especially where there's agreements where the pricing might have a variable uh, based on the amount of publishing. So we need to make sure that we're keeping uh, our publishers accountable to the, the data in terms of the volume of publishing. Sustainability is also uh, really, really important, especially in light of the, the challenges that libraries have in regards to budgets now. Uh, we do uh, request that uh, the agreements have uh, uncapped amounts of publishing during the term, but costs are capped uh, as well. Uh, and we need to make sure that these um, the agreements stay within the library budgets. And then consistency is something else that we look for. Uh, so Call is working with the GISC model license uh, and there are others out there such as the ESAC open access uh, service level agreement. So that's the last of my slides. Uh, you'll get these links when these slides are distributed. And so at this point, what I would like to do is to hand over to the final presenter, Martin. And make Martin presenter, there you go. It should be all yours now, Martin. Can you all see my slides? It's Martin here. No, we're seeing um, your directory. We're seeing your desktop. Ah, there we go. Can you see my slides now? Yes, they're in um, presenter mode though. How's that? Perfect. Perfect. Great. 
Hello everybody and good afternoon. It's Martin here um, and it is great to be here with you this afternoon and thanks for joining. This afternoon I'm going to be talking as the final part um, uh, here of the presentations about how to achieve FAIR using repositories and I'll be talking mostly about institutional repositories uh, which our institutions have had already for over a decade. So I want to start by saying uh, uh, that what we've been doing with our repositories remains to be very important still, um, even with what's happening with Plan S, even with SWAF, even with what's happening with publish and read and read and publish agreements, uh, because our repositories are still the major mechanism for making uh, the read-only content available openly uh, to people and researchers um, who don't have access to, to all the wide range um, of library resources uh, through subscriptions. And it's an area too in which institutions still um, have got control and influence. So um, it provides an alternative pathway and perhaps also provides, um, I think, a source of insurance or backup um, as well. And of course, I think by having, um, I think the green open access route, it helps to put a pressure on publishers in a commercial sense. So. I guess the main message of my slide here is that the pressure remains on and we have to keep on doing what we've been doing. Um, so you will have seen in various, you know, so other ways perhaps in other channels that we're really looking still at well under half of Australian research outputs being openly available. And so there's still a lot of work to do. We've, um, you know, we've heard a lot there from Angus about the publishers um, um, are making our strides in the open space, but it, it is in a commercial sense, and so we need to pay for that if we're going to um, if we're going to go with that option. While using repositories can come at no cost, um, except for infrastructure um, and uh, no support costs. We're also seeing that some publishers are moving away from supporting green open access, um, so. I think making these moves helps to cement the position in the marketplace for them. Plus, we're also seeing a move from open access into science. Um, you know, so we're going from OA to OAS, uh, which includes methods and data as well. So it's important, I think, to grow the business in that direction. And thinking about our institutions and also how they're going to work with, you know, with other researchers around the world in partnership, um, if those other research groups um, are already working with OA or they're working with FAIR or they're working also with the OA or, or slightly with OS, um, you know, how can we make sure that we can uh, collaborate with them? And if we're not going to collaborate with them, well, then how are we going to perform in the marketplace? So I think the pressure remains on too because Plan S has released a, you know, has le has also released information and the requirements. Um, they've given guidelines for repositories and CORL has also released a roadmap to Plan S for Australia. So I think that sets the scene that there um, is still a lot of work for us to do. Uh, we don't yet have a national approach to open access or open science. Um, We've still got at roughly half of universities in Australia. Um, we also have a policy on open access, open science. Um, you know, others may have guidelines. Um, we also found in the call review of Australasian, um, where we had the call review of repositories, uh, that Australian repositories weren't actually meeting um, with all the guidelines of Plan S for repositories. Uh, there are quite a few that came very close, but as a marketplace as a whole, there's still a lot of work to do. But this also is interesting because with CORE, uh, they did a study and found that the, they found that the popular repository tools, uh, that they could be used to meet Plan S requirements for repositories. So I think that suggests um, in many cases, that's how we're using them. Uh, whether we've got policy, uh, you know, whether we've got practices, whether we're monitoring, um, um, also whether we are working with authors to um, also to add more items to repositories. Um, also here, 
here at ANZ, um, we've got a small number of member institutions to core, and I think we could do maybe um, more in our marketplace to bring the benefits back and to share them amongst institutions more broadly. Also, um, it's wonderful the work that we have done uh, through the call um, and also like you know, the repository community, really excellent work. Um, there was a recommendation there um, to increase the support, perhaps in the technical advisory group space um, and to do more work in between the major events together so that we move together. So um, I'm now just going to move through FAIR, starting here with Findable. So things that you can do with your repositories to include, you know, which will help to improve findability. Um, you need to maybe do some work to ensure that web search agents um, and also harvesters um, are actively working to harvest all the content that you've got. Uh, there'll be different ways of doing that with different tools, but of course you'll be familiar. Um, we did find um, in the call review that on the whole that was done quite well. Also National Library of Australia has released a new version of Trove. Um, we asked in that project team uh, to, um, if there could be work uh, to improve um, I think the way how research material from our repositories was made available. Um, and I think they actually um, have made a good improvement there and it's really, really great to see. So um, I'd like to thank the NLA for that. Have a think too um, about with publications, are you also making the data associated with that publication available or are you only making the publication? It's important to also make all the metadata I think available in your repository and not just metadata where there is full text um, attached. Uh, that really does help to, I think, to help the findability um, of what you have. I know that will affect the ratio of full text, but I think ultimately, if we're aiming for a higher amount of content, um, I think making the metadata available may also act as an incentive to authors to also add their full text. You can automate a lot of the metadata work uh, through the CRIS system or the information system. Um, you can harvest it from subject repositories. Um, obviously authors, they can be publishing um, into a wide range of repositories. Uh, it'd be good, uh, I think, practice for institutions to identify that content and to harvest um, and to place a copy in the institutional repository um, as well, rather than just the the other thing that I think was highlighted um, also in the call paper was around um, work in making sure that the content will be there for a long time. So uh, th this was actually one of the largest uh, gaps in our marketplace in ANZ um, was around having, you know, was it like having like the, uh, the strategy in place for preservation of the material for the long term. We go to age to accessible. So it's important to look at what is the rate of deposit for publications and data um, um, in your instance of your repository. Uh, and to work, I think, closely with authors as much as possible. Um, you know, you'll have multiple areas of your library perhaps working together to do that. For example, helping them uh, with licensing, example like using a Creative Commons. Uh, license. Um, again, I think as we see more publish and read agreements come through, I'm hoping that we will be able to contract uh, to build an OA router type solution to them to increase uh, the auto, you know, like uh, the auto ingest of content into repositories. Um, another way to work very closely with your authors is to monitor the compliance with funder mandates with your authors. Um, and to audit and then perhaps uh, that you contact your authors and you follow up and you chase them uh, for the author final manuscript. Um, and you can use there the policies of the funders, um, I think is the reason to do that. Um, I think it's also perhaps good practice if possible to harvest and host uh, the full text of outputs which um, are already 
um, hosted in subject repositories, for example, um, I just think it gives a backup and an insurance that that material will be there. We're up to I for interoperable. This is really about a machine readable. Um, this really applies to metadata and the file formats. Um, it helps to facilitate harvesting. Um, also helps to facilitate reuse um, of material as well, um, and uh, the sharing. Um, so I just wonder if also, just as a comment, um, we had funding nationally uh, for repositories for publications at one time, and then at another time, uh, we had funding for data repositories, which is really, really great. It helped put Australia into a good spot, I think, internationally um, with that infrastructure. But I think as we've been running those for a time now uh, together, maybe have a think about when is the right time to merge the publication and data repository workflows because it might help her to simplify and to improve i think her the experience for authors and then through bit um, and then of course after interoperability you still have all the functions working as before um, we did find in the call repositories port though that there wasn't really um, i think a lot to gain in investing um, in a national infrastructure for repositories and all centrally. Um, so I think, I think at this time we identified really the benefit was to improve what we already have um, rather than, than to have another um, investment and project. Reusable, um, I think one of the main things there is to support authors to publish with a Creative Commons license. So, um, and that of course are the um, they also hold copyright um, and don't hand it over. Um, and then for data, there is um, also the information about how and where the research was formed through provenance information. It's important to make sure that the outputs are interoperable, okay, so that our machines can use those. But I think as a backup, you can also offer a mediation and a negotiation process for some of your outputs too, if necessary. So really the final steps, I think, um, is to be aware of your fairness um, and to review it on a regular basis. Um, you should develop, um, I think, a plan for how you're going to make your repository a compliant with Plan S um, and also like with our funder requirements, if you haven't done that already. Um, I think you can also develop a web, you can also develop a work plan that will help you for, to move from OA into the broader sort of realm of OS as well. I think that's a good thing to do at this time. Uh, the AOSG, um, we also have a new group, or the practitioners group, um, and they're doing uh, some work on guidance for Fair Aware. So look out for that too. I think it's good to regularly, you know, to have a look at your repository and audit uh, the compliance with Fair Principles. Um, and to make all the improvements ongoing um, as you can manage to do them, I think in a continuous way. Um, and then the last slide, I've just given you some links and some references. There. Thank you very much. Um, we'll hand back. Thank you, Martin. I think if you just click stop sharing. Did you need a hand? Yeah. Oh yeah, that's good. We'll just leave it on that. Um, so if we could all, if all the presenters could turn on their webcams, that would be helpful at the moment. Right. Okay, thank you all very much. That's very good. Um, there's quite a few questions here. So let's get through to the first one, which is for Angus. Um, the question is, I gather that the read component is only for those with the agreement though, not full open access, read access. So the read component is only for those with the, uh, so the yes, no, um, the read component um, 
at an institutional level, yes, would be only available to that particular institution. However, as part of their read and publish agreement, the, the total value of the deal is supporting um, the open access publishing as well. The, the institution or the consortium, when they organise this, will, will get access to all the content that that publisher has as part of that agreement. When we looked, this is why we try and do things on a consortial basis though, so that we can um, get the um, read component available to all of the institutions um, within, the, uh, within the consortium uh, and then further open up the access to content that way. Great, thank you, Angus. Uh, there's a question for Martin. Not everyone is familiar with what a CRIS system is, and they're asking what is CRIS system and how what does automate metadata via CRIS mean? Yes, yeah, so what I was talking there um, is about using technology of a current research information system, um, which does automated harvesting of publication uh, metadata for your institution and then puts them into a research management system. So often you've got CRIS systems and the repository, uh, they can be set up to have a two-way data flow. So you can um, you can have authors who, who can add the metadata and the publication manually, for example, either through the CRIS system or through the repository system and then they'll share information and in the background you've got the CRIS system doing the automated harvesting of the metadata from publishers and then it pushes it automatically. To Thank you. Okay I have a question here which is for myself I think. Um, being a data commons what is ARDC's interest beyond data? Um, I, I did say at the start but perhaps people came in late um, that Yes, our focus is research data. Um, however, research data is best discovered and reused within context. So if you can find the data, it's very helpful if you can also find the publication which mentions the data, the grant that funded the data, the project that um, developed that collected the data, um, the researchers that were involved in collecting it, the research organisations, etc. Um, so that's one reason. We also offer persistent identifier services uh, to the sector, which concentrate on research data in particular, so DOIs for data, but also related materials, grey literature, such as reports and so forth, are offered to the sector through ARDC. We work with the AAF on the Australia, um, the Australian Orchid Consortium to help support um, the adoption of orchids across the sector and other persistent identifiers such as uh, the international geo sample number that identify physical samples in the course of research um, etc. So it's all about connecting the dots really and enabling all of those outputs to be fair. So that's our interest there. Um, next question. Uh, I would like to ask Ginny if she can share the page of her presentation where she explained that free, big capital letters, sources are limited and get better with a Creative Commons license, but with FAIR, it is best for reuse, accessibility, etc. Um, I actually, I won't, I won't share that page because I'm not sure technically it's probably take me too long to do that, but I can talk through it quickly. So the concept really is that we often think that stuff on the internet is um, is openly available, but in fact, most of the time it's just free to read. So um, uh, it's a huge cause of confusion, particularly for people that haven't thought too much about the, the concept of licensing and such like. The point about putting the Creative Commons license on, um, if, you're, as a, if you're a creator, then it kind of specifies exactly how that work can be used and reused. You can choose it to be as open as, as you want it to be. But the um, the, where the FAIR comes into it is um, it's in addition to the Creative Commons licensing. So not a, well, not only having a, um, a license on it, but also having the metadata associated with it, such as the identifiers that Pasha was talking about, means that you know much more about the provenance of that article. Um, and also it means that you can accurately, more accurately cite it and you can uh, incorporate it into other research outputs more efficiently. So it's, I'm happy to share that page more generally afterwards and you can um, contact me directly, but it's, um, it's really, a, it's, it, they all build on each other. And I would just say in particular, don't ever assume that something, that it's okay for something just to be free, particularly a research output, because it's not, you're not then able to really specify what it can be used for. Right, thank you Ginny. Um, 
I'm not sure who will be best placed to answer this question. It's about Creative Commons license. So how important is it that authors publish with a CC license? Are publishers likely retrospectively to make publications OA, given that we saw that they could do this during COVID? I mean, I'll take that question. That's one of my favourite topics, <laughs> is that the Creative <laughs> Commons licence is incredibly important. So indeed, um, we are seeing right now on the, the CORD19 database that I showed you, there are some publishers who, um, it was uh, in, set up by the White House, um, by the Office of Science and Technology Policy. They asked all the publishers to put a Creative Commons attribution licence on, which is the, the, the most liberal of the licences, apart from the one for data. Um, some publishers did, quite a lot of publishers didn't do that and what we're seeing now is those publishers are already trying to withdraw their articles from that CORD19 database. So um, there, I can't overestimate the, uh, underestimate the importance of the Creative Commons licences. We know for example that articles that are just made free by publishers on a, on a you know, sort of charitable basis can be withdrawn down the track. So incredibly important. Thank you. Follow up question. <laughs> bonus for the bonus points. <laughs> Is the CC by attribution the only license you recommend? Um, yeah, I didn't have time to go into all the licenses, obviously, this is a pretty whistle-stop tour through FAIR, but I think CC BY is, is a reasonable one to start with, um, but I would just uh, point, point to the fact that the Creative Commons have a great license chooser on their website that literally walks you through what, what you want to do with the use and reuse of your article, so I'm happy to share that afterwards, but I would say as a default, the CC BY is a good one to con consider. Thank you. Martin's in the hot seat now. There's a couple of questions um, that are quite similar. I'll read them both out, however. Um, could Martin please elaborate on the reasons why the Call Repositories report found little benefit in a National Research Australia infrastructure? From an efficiency standpoint, it seems odd that each individual institution has to maintain its own installation of software and infrastructure and associated workflows. And the question which is very similar. Could you please walk us through Call's reasoning around deciding that investment in a centralised or national repository wasn't worth pursuing? Mm. So it's um, it's really about a matter of what investment um, um, has already made, been made and what are the benefits and what investment could be made in future and what are the benefits. So we've already saved a lot of money for our repositories. Um, finding that uh, the level of fairness was sort of reasonable and growing. Also, we felt that with the current, you know, sort of architecture and infrastructure, um, that um, most of the area for improvement was not the systems; it was actually the practice, which need and um, um, and also working with authors that needed more work. Um, if if we were to move to central, you know, sort of infrastructure that would require extra investment in systems, um, which we don't have at the moment. Um, at CALL, we discussed that there wasn't really um, a willingness to invest additional money in new systems when it was found that the systems could be used to become more fair compliant. So I guess the issue is that if we wanted more effort and more um, you know, work on projects around repositories, it was found that benefit would be found by practice and not by the systems. There is, of course, some work um, for each institution to, to host, um, but that was the feeling in the room. Okay, thank you. A few more questions. Um, okay, so related to Martin's point on linking data and publications in repositories. Are there any RDA plans to make those links easier or is Martin suggesting moving away from an RDA type central data repository? So I'll just clarify that if that ref was that referring to Research Data Australia, is that how I'm reading that? Um, because if it does, I just need to clarify that we aren't. Research Data Australia, which is the ARDC's flagship discovery service for research data um, from Australian research institutions, actually just is a, is a metadata aggregator. In other words, we collect the records, the metadata records from all of those contributors. We don't actually hold the data. It's not a repository in terms of um, storing the data. 
Um, and we do make all of those links available in RDA and to third parties such as OpenAir. So you can provide links to publications um, from the data sets in RDA and we strongly suggest you do because they then go on to um, something, a, a sort of a hidden type of infrastructure called Scolix where the publishers can actually take those links and expose them so that you can find that information in say the Scopus database and so forth. You can find the publication in Scopus and link back to the date to the data set in an institutional repository uh, but Martin did you want to comment on any of that yes I can uh, yes uh, so my comments were really about at the institution end I thought um, that you know that now might be the time that may suit institutions uh, to merge repositories for data and for publications if you have got to um, I wasn't commenting um, about uh, the role of RDA I think I think that's got a separate role Okay, thank you. We have only two minutes to go and we have a few questions, so we may not get through all of them. There is a comment though that um, just in response to your previous answer about the Call Repositories project, some of us have fallen through the gaps. We haven't received any money for our repository solution and workflow. So it's just a comment there. Um, there's a question about licensing again, Jenny, back to you. Presumably you would not recommend the CCND no derivatives license. Yeah, so look, I think I just think this comes back to the purposes of your of what you're aiming to do with the research itself, and if there are specific issues to do with it. So, I, I wouldn't I wouldn't recommend or not recommend any particular license. I would strongly encourage you to look at the license chooser. I'm more than happy to answer specific questions, or obviously we have a Creative Commons Australia um, group that can also walk you through them. I don't think there are there are times when the no derivatives may be appropriate. Okay. Uh, thank you. There's a comment here that uh, just noticed that the new trove records for our OA repository content says not online even when the repository record includes CC license. So that's something to refer back to the National Library, I think. Um, second last question as we close out. Uh, question for all. Recent articles on OA by Pivovar, Pivovar that's Heather Pivovar at L, distinguish between green, gold, and bronze OA, among others. They fold what you've called free to read research into bronze OA, freely available research that lacks clear licenses or permission to share or reuse. What is your attitude toward including free to read as kind of OA? We'll just take one answer from one person, one presenter here. Well, I, I it, 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 it isn't OA. I mean, it is free to read. It's, 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 it's um, access that can be withdrawn. So bronze OA is not OA. It is free to read, essentially. Um, and I think it just adds to the massive confusion that I mentioned with the um, multiple definitions of open access. OK, thank you. Last question. In five years, this is a big question, so I'm just going to take <laughs> one answer from one person. In five years, what will be the new frontiers for open scholarship? Martin, you should take that. <laughs> I don't know, Angus. <laughs> well, ideally, no paywalls. I think is, is what we're we're working towards at Call. Um, you know, if, if we can get to that point, I th it has to remember that you know OA is not free. You know, there is always a cost um, somewhere along the line, of, and if we can manage those costs as well to make sure it's sustainable within uh, and using you know reliant, well within the money that's within the system within Australia. Uh, and New Zealand, uh, I would thought that that's where I would like to see things heading in five years. Great, thank you very much. Right, um, okay, so we've come to the end of our webinar. Thank you everybody very much for joining us. Thank you to all the speakers for giving their time and for sharing all their insights and knowledge today. Um, if you want to know more about upcoming webinars, you can go to the ardc.edu.au site and you can have a look at the events calendar and you can subscribe to our newsletter. This session will be recorded and the slides will be shared. The recording will be put up on the ARDC's YouTube channel. So really great that you could join us. Have a lovely day and thanks all. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.